So, 70% of the Palestinians live below the poverty line. 70% of the Palestinians live on less than $2 a day. And it's an induced impoverishment. There's no reason for it. It's simply been induced by Israel. Well, the only thing I have in Arab culture, if in order for my son to marry, I have to provide my son and his prospective bride with a house. In other words, this is, this is the minimal. You know, my son can marry when there's a house that he can bring his wife to and, 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 and begin his family. Well, the only resource I have, I'm poor as a Palestinian, is land, that mainly that I've inherited from my family, that on that land I can build a modest home for my son so he can marry. Well, uh, uh, the land falls in area C, because that's 60, actually 62% of the West Bank. And Israel has a policy since 1967 of not allowing Palestinians to build new homes. There's a building freeze on Palestinian homes for the last 45 years, which is two generations. Not only can't my son have a home, but his son can't have a home to live in with their family. It's two generations or more of a freeze. And the way it's done really quickly is that all of the West Bank has been zoned by Israel as agricultural land. And therefore, if a Palestinian comes and wants to build a home, the answer is, geez, you know, we'd love to help you out, but this is agricultural land. But you say, well, wait a minute. There's, on that same land, that Palestinians can't build on, there's 200 settlements. There's a half a million Israelis. How does that work? Well, it's easy. We sit on the planning commissions. So if you want to rezone from agriculture to residential, it takes you a second if you want to do it. So it's how planning and zoning become tools of a political agenda. And in East Jerusalem, all of Palestinian East Jerusalem, East Jerusalem has been zoned as open green space, which has the same effect. So, so then Palestinians uh, uh, want to build on land that they own, and when they try, they, uh, they get demolition orders. So as we've said, about 27,000 Palestinian homes have been demolished in the occupied territories since 1967. I just want to take a couple minutes and show you how that works. Just to, to give you a sense a little bit of, of, of the occupation and, and, and what's happening. This is Salim Shawamre, his wife Arabia. Now they have seven children. At that time there were six children. And uh, uh, Salim went to Saudi Arabia <coughs> with his wife. Uh, they worked there, and when the Oslo peace process began, like thousands of other Palestinians that believed that peace is on the way, house demolitions will end, they came back to Palestine in order to build a home and, and both begin a life of their own, but also to come back and begin to build their country. So they bought a small plot of land right near the Shuafat refugee camp. Uh, which uh, where Salim uh, near Jerusalem, where Salim was born and grew up, where Salim grew up at least, uh, in Area C, applied for a, a, a building permit to the Israeli authorities, what's called the civil administration. It gets very Orwellian. The language is important, so we call our military government a civil administration in order to pretend that this is normal administration, there's no occupation, there's nothing unusual. And so Salim applied three times. Each time it costs about 4,000 pounds to apply for a building permit. Now he happened to have a little bit of money. He had worked in Saudi Arabia. Most Palestinians don't have 4,000 pounds spare to go apply for a permit they know they're not going to get. It's a whole catch-22 kind of a system. And in fact, he was refused, but they told him, because they play good cop, bad cop mind games with the Palestinians. 
He said, you know what, you're a nice guy, apply again. You know, we didn't give it to you this time because it's agricultural land. So apply for an agricultural permit. And so Salim applied again, another 4,000 pounds, and again he was refused. And he said, you know what, you're a really good guy. You've never made any problems. Apply again, I think we'll give it to you. Another 4,000 pounds, applies again. And this time he was refused on the grounds that, um, that uh, he was missing two signatures on his deed. He can't prove the land is really his. So, you know, there's all kinds of pretenses like that. And finally, like thousands of other Palestinian families, he built, he and his wife Arabia built this modest home and lived in the home for five years. They got a demolition order right away, but they lived in their home for five years. One day, in July of 1998, they're having lunch, and there's a knock on the door. Salim answers the door, and here he's confronted by the officials of the civil administration. I don't know what civil servants look like here in London, but this is what they look like if you're a Palestinian. This is Rami, and this is Micha, two officials of the civil administration, both of whom are civilians, <coughs> as you can see, not exactly unarmed civilians, accompanied by soldiers, some of which are having kind of a good time that day, being out. And, uh, and they're settlers, because the, the civil administration is in the middle of the West Bank. The only Israelis that will come to work there are, are uh, settlers. So you have people in power over Palestinians to decide what Palestinians can have a house or not, you know, and, and you take people who are ideologically hostile to Palestinians. Come on in. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is an opera presentation, is that what you mean? <laughs> so, <clears throat> Salim answers the door. Rami says to him, is this your house? Salim says, yes, it's, it's my house. He says, no, it isn't. It's our house now. You have 15 minutes to get all your belongings out. We're going to demolish it. Now, what would you do? And this is not for security. Salim is not a terrorist. He was never involved in politics in particular. What would you do? You wouldn't say, dear, would you please help me take out the dining room table. They're going to demol you would protest. And the minute you protest, it turns into a, a military issue. You're resisting now a, a military order. And Salim was beaten and thrown out of his house. Now, in all the commotion that's going on, his wife, Arabia, and their six kids, she managed to close the door behind them and lock it. And, uh, and uh, it, you know, she didn't, doesn't know Hebrew, she doesn't know what really what's going on, and so on. So the soldiers uh, broke the windows of the house and threw in tear gas canisters. Now, I don't know if you ever had a whiff of tear gas in general. It's very powerful stuff. And inside your home, with your kids, it's overpowering. Then the soldiers broke into the house. Arabia was carried out unconscious. The kids screaming and yelling in all directions. And, uh, and then the soldiers uh, uh, came into the house. Now, at this point, we get involved, Israeli activists. If we can get there in time, we get in front of the bulldozers that are demolishing the homes. That's why I'm built this way. <laughs> <laughs> I was hired more for my body than for... <laughs> or we chain ourselves in the houses, or we get on the roof, we try to delay the demolition. And while we're doing that, our activists are calling journalists, they're calling diplomats. In other words, to try to, to raise the attention, because if there's enough commotion raised, the armies come to demolish 10 houses. So they might demolish one, two, three, four, and then when there starts to be a lot of attention, they'll, they'll retreat. So maybe we can save four or five houses. So we resist, and then we're thrown out. Now, we're Israeli Jews. 
So we have a privileged position. They're not going to shoot us. They're not going to arrest us. They're not going to beat us up like they would with Palestinians. If Salim would get in front of a bulldozer, they'd shoot him. No questions asked. But you know, I'm this old kind of weird guy, so they might detain us for an hour or two, but we're able then to protest and resist in ways that Palestinians can't. So finally, we're out of the house, the family's out of the house, and they come to, well, before that, I think this is a little out of order, one second. Then what happens is, um, foreign workers are sent in to take out all the furniture. The, the civil administration subcontracts to commercial wrecking companies. So if you happen to own a bulldozer, you can get a contract to demolish homes. So the contractor comes, this is a guy from Romania, for example. And he's told you got, you got five minutes, throw everything out. So imagine what you have in your home. Your home really is your sacred space with your papers, your kids' toys, your furniture, your photos, everything. And it's all thrown out, scattered to the wind, and, uh, and, uh, and the house is, is, is empty. Then the bulldozer comes <coughs> uh, to demolish the house. Here he's coming through the wall that Selim built, through the garden, and begins to demolish the home. Now here, there's also a tragedy within a tragedy. You know, these things all have their, their wrinkles to them. The driver of the bulldozer is a Palestinian. Yeah, he's just a guy that works for this company. In the morning, he'll come one morning, and, and the owner says, you're going to go build a road. 